Okay. Next video. Whoa. What just happened? So I did a video a little while ago talking about my research journey from school to PhD and a topic which I briefly touched on in that video which apparently a lot of people want to know more about is how I arrived at my area of research. So for those of you who might be new to the channel, my area of research was in atmospheric physics. I wrote my thesis on stratospheric dynamics. and. That's kind of interesting because I went to university wanting to do something in fusion research. To explain how I ended up doing atmospheric physics instead, I should give you two pieces of background. Firstly, why I was interested in fusion, and secondly, what being taught physics at uni is like. When I was a kid, I was super interested in science, but specifically biology. I wasn't actually that interested in physics. I couldn't have really told you what physics was when I was a kid, but I knew from a childhood obsessed with dinosaurs and reading books by Gerald Durrell, I was super into the environment. And from a young age, I was aware of the issue of global warming and climate change, and that it was in a way the defining issue of our times. And so I was determined to do something specifically in relation to that with my life. Later, when I went to school and science as a subject was split into physics, biology and chemistry, I realised that all the cool stuff was in physics and so I knew I wanted to study physics. So I had to think of a way to combine those two things of taking physics or the stuff that I was learning in class and applying it in some way to make the environment better. And then, as now, the kind of big hope for the future is nuclear fusion, this clean, unlimited source of energy. And so I decided that that was what I wanted to dedicate myself to. However, when I got to university, I realised that actually the physics of nuclear fusion is pretty much settled. It's not a physics problem anymore, it's an engineering problem of how we practically do it. And when it came to that, I realised that my enthusiasm kind of waned. That really wasn't what I wanted to do. I knew I wasn't at heart an engineer. And so I went through my physics degree not really having a specific motivating force behind what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go into industry or into research or into teaching or anything, really. I was basically keeping my options open. And the way that you're taught physics, at least in the UK, and I guess this is specifically at Oxford, is that you do idealise cases of things. You know, when you're doing Newtonian mechanics, you're dealing with smooth spheres on frictionless surfaces. It never really felt terribly real. So perhaps that explains why when I got to my third year and I'd done mechanics and thermodynamics and quantum theory and electrodynamics and optics and circuits and all these things which weren't really as you experienced them in the real world. When I came across the third year module, which was fluids, flows and complexity, I kind of fell in love. Really, the John Green quote about falling in love like you fall asleep slowly, then suddenly all at once, was pretty much true for me in, in the field. Basically, I took this module and for the first couple of weeks of the course, you're dealing with problems about the Navier-Stokes equations, which is like the master equation of how fluids move generally. And also, you know, considering what is a fluid. And I was sort of plodding along and thinking, this is actually cool. This, this feels like something that, you, you know, you can use in the real world. It's a continuous medium that you can describe in just a couple of equations, not like a perfect sphere, like on a, on a frictionless surface. This was not a point particle, but a medium, a continuous medium. And I was, I was thinking, man, this is, this is cool. This is, you could describe the atmosphere like this. And then when we did, I think there was an extension problem on one of the problem sets, applying these equations to a, um, it was a liquid between two plates that were heated. And it was actually a, a question that they told us not to worry about because it wasn't on the syllabus for that particular year. They changed it around. And I did it anyway, because the idea of combining heating the fluid with change and that and cause that heating, changing how it moved, suddenly sold me. I, I, I just suddenly had this, this connection with it. I was like, that is how you describe a real world system. That is how you describe the ocean or the atmosphere. And I think pretty much from that problem sheet onwards, I just knew that that was what I wanted to do. I'd sort of refound my focus. 
because it connected back to climate. It connected me back to the real world and sort of allowed those two things which I was really interested in, in physics and analytically describing things, and the real world and the biosphere, and combining them together into one subject, which I didn't even know existed at the start of my degree. So that determined the area of physics that I was interested in. But then more than that, I ended up doing stratospheric dynamics. And that is something of a different story. I think I speak for most physics PhDs, at least in the UK, when I say that PhDs are typically picked by the student. It's quite unusual from the people that I know to actually go to university with a research proposal saying this is exactly what I want to do. Because by the end of your degree, you only have a cursory experience of the different bits of physics, and even in the area that you're really interested in, having done it at master's level, you don't have a huge depth of experience to draw on. So typically students will actually pick from PhD proposals that supervisors put forward and they say these are the projects we're offering this year. And so when I applied to Oxford and Reading, um, I had a look at the projects that were available and I decided on ones which sounded interesting, like a, a short list. Then I met with the supervisors and determined which ones I ultimately wanted to apply for. The project I applied for at Oxford, which I was offered the place at, was on stratospheric dynamics uh, with Professor Leslie Gray and it was uh, more solar based. It was a coupling of the of solar forcing and stratospheric dynamics. And um, I basically picked that because it had ramifications for climate change, it had very real, you know, if, if I did research well it could have very real impacts. But I also chose it because Leslie, as a supervisor, had a fantastic track record, all of her students said she was lovely and that she knew what she was doing, and so I just thought on the whole this felt like a good project for me. It matched some, you know, it, it, there was enough overlap with what I was interested in combined with the other things to make me interested in it. It's then at this point where I didn't have an active hand in what happened next because for those of you who know the story before, I basically lost out on my place at Oxford because of uh, funding disappearing and I was offered a place instead at Exeter which was set up by Professor Gray with my actual eventual supervisor, Professor Mark Baldwin. That was also in stratospheric dynamics because that was what the original project that I was going to be working on was in. And so I, I suppose I did have ultimate kind of control over what area I did my research in, but that was a definite jump. That was a definite link that I had minimal control over, which is going to be kind of a fringe case that that's not normal for PhDs, but that was what happened with me. That then narrowed things down from physics to atmospheric physics to stratospheric dynamics. But then even within that, there was the tiniest subbranch of quasi-geostrophic coupling of the stratosphere and troposphere in the aftermath of southern stratospheric warmings, which is what I ended up doing my research on. And how I arrived at that was probably about 50% informed by what my supervisor's expertise was in. He kind of discovered the phenomena that I ended up researching. But about 50% based on kind of going back to why I did a physics degree in the first place, which was playing around with equations and playing around with pencil and paper and describing physical systems analytically. This was an area of research that I could derive a new theory and um, sort of set it out in equations and test it. It wasn't purely statistics based, it wasn't um, going out in the field and, and, and collecting measurements, it was an abstracted representation of a real physical system as closely as possible via just a couple of equations describing a continuous medium. So it was going back to the roots of why I got interested in physics in the first place, which is kind of nice really. You know, you had the initial driver for why I got into the field, narrowed down by sort of various circumstances and problems that I did, and then that last bit of specialization was determined by the very first thing that got me into the field in the first place. Basically, I just followed my gut. This is the advice that I always give to people when they ask me about, you know, choosing a specialism within physics, is to follow your guts, just to trust your gut instinct. Of course, you have to be exposed to different areas of physics to be able to do that, so don't feel like you have to choose an area early on. I didn't decide on what I wanted to do in my PhD really until like the end of third year. There was between third year and fourth year, I did a research project over the summer and I decided I definitely want to do a PhD and I want to do it in this area. So that was super late on in my degree. And I was only able to make that decision because I have been exposed to pretty much every branch of physics. The Oxford physics course is very broad. So I had that knowledge to be able to make that call. So I'd say to people, if you're watching this and you're worried about picking a sub field, Take your time, be exposed to different bits of physics, and see what grabs your attention. And hopefully, you will just find a field like I did and just fall in love with it. And when you know, you know. 
So get exposed to a lot of subfields before making your decision and ultimately trust your gut. You know better than anybody else what you're interested in and your interest in what you're gonna do in your research is the single most important thing that will get you through your research and allow you to survive. That was how I made my decision and that's my personal advice to anyone who's watching this. But if you are watching this and you are a researcher or you know, you're currently doing your PhD, how did you end up at your subfield? Because I imagine everybody has a slightly different story. I hope with commonalities, basically meaning following your gut. But I'd like to hear your story as well. Leave that down in the comments. This was a very rambly video. It's the first one in a long time that I haven't actually scripted. So I hope I was able to salvage something of this in the edit. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, do pop it a like, leave your research story down there in the comments, and thank you again for watching. I'll see you next time.